Welcome to the, I, uh, to the ISR seminar series. I'm Raymond Fleischmann, Professor and uh, Deputy Director here at the Institute for Sustainable Resources at UCL. Before I start the official things, I should make a sort of a housekeeping announcement. There is no planned fire alarm, so if there is a fire bell ringing, it's serious, please cautiously move, uh, move out of this room. Then also please don't leave any of your belongings unattended. This is not a 100% secure room. What else? We are videotaping this uh, whole event. Uh, so you don't have to take notes. It will all be on the internet in like one week from now. Um, it's now my very special pleasure mm. to welcome Marinke van Riet, yeah. um, who I met one year ago, <laughs> as we just figured out. Uh, and it's I was at a conference in Potsdam, which was about resource governance in Africa, mm. which probably also explained your main focus of expertise. And Marinke is international director at an organization called Publish What You Pay. And this is like a, uh, a precise description of what we what discuss we do. today, yeah. actually, because resources as we all know, they fall like manna from heaven. Uh, and some of us may have realized they quite often come from countries such as Africa. They often need to be extracted. And this means that there are lots of incentive to do it in a more or less illicit manner. It often comes with things like corruption. You need to have a provision to start the extraction processes. And you can imagine in many countries this is not well organized, there's intransparency, and this is why the whole transparency movement is about disclosing information, mm -hmm. publish what you pay. Mm -hmm. So this could then eventually lead to better well-being for yes. local people, yeah. which is called well, the kind of uh, paradox of plenty, plenty. Yeah. discussion. That it often does not happen that way. There are some more promising. Uh, indicators more recently. However, it's not that easy. And I look forward to the whole discussion with you. I've learned that you try to do it in a more interactive manner. The usual style is we have a lecture, then followed by Q&A. Today we will uh, do it a bit more interactive with you. <coughs> Still, we try to finish like quarter to seven and then have some drinks and a little bit beer nipples uh, upstairs. Uh, so the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Raymond, and a uh, pleasure to be here. And I'll be guiding you on a whirlwind tour of the world called Publish What You Pay. Publish What You Pay actually started here in London, by founded by six UK-based NGOs, including Global Witness, the Open Society Institute, uh, CAFOT, the Catholic um, Services for Overseas Development, Transparency International, um, CARE, um, and those were the six organizations that in numerous research reports felt that the lack of financial transparency in the gas, oil and mining sector had aided mismanagement, corruption and in the case of Angola even fueled conflict. And in all their recommendations they made a key one to publish what you pay. Really a recommendation for companies to publish what you pay, for governments to publish what they earn. And hence, uh, publish what you pay um, was founded. 12 years later, we are now over 800 members strong, covering 62 countries. And in 35 countries, uh, civil society has actually come together to form Publish What You Pay affiliated coalitions. And we're here for one purpose. Um, our slogan is extracting the truth. We really want a complete financial openness, complete accountability of the extractive industries in order that the revenues can provide uh, improvements in standard of living of ordinary women, men and youth living in countries where there is, uh, th that's rich in, in natural resources. So I'm going to try and make this as interactive as possible. I'm not really used to lecturing. I'm used to doing a lot of speaking at conferences where I, I pose questions and I invite you to, to a little bit of a debate. And my first question to you is kind of a nice nice one that I want to start off with is, in your opinion, who actually owns natural resources? Because this is the core of the Publisher GP movement and there is a, a, a whole range of responses and I just want to get a feel of what's out there in this room. In your opinion, who is the owner of natural resources? 
Yes, go ahead. Everybody and nobody. Everybody, very good. Everybody and nobody. Can you explain a little bit? Uh, in the same way as water mm. uh, moves around uh, the earth at various different rates, you can't actually own it. Mm. Um, and uh, other resources you know, are, are where they're able to be mined, but uh, they belong to the planet, not the, 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 the temporary nature of animal who's living on it at any time. Mm. Okay. Any other completely opposite responses? Yes? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Any other? We actually say as published but you pay they belong to the people. And simply the state is the custodian and has a responsibility to manage those resources to the benefit of the people. In a lot of legal frameworks, it says that the state is the owner. Um, uh, the only exception to that, or one of the few exceptions, is the US, where actually what the landowner owns both the soil and the subsoil. So there's a really interesting dynamic there that an individual landowner can also own everything, all the natural resources that are, that are under the subsoil. Um, if the state is... Th yes, you wanted to make a... Well, yeah. Just the government has just changed that from banking, doesn't it? Yeah. That's an example of to what extent the state really does other things. Mm. But actually, it can change. That's very dangerous, yeah, with fracking especially. I mean, even in France, they're now trying to open a moratorium on fracking. So yeah, yeah, it's a very dangerous, dangerous trend. Um, but we are sort of... A Just yes? So if people speaking up here mm -hmm. are probably difficult, people speaking up here are probably <laughs> difficult to understand, <laughs> and if they go through rule, therefore I would like everybody who speaks to speak, speak up. Uh, louder and speak okay. up so that everybody in the room can understand you. Yeah. yeah, fair point. Yeah. Did you, did you want to repeat that, what you said? Um, the, the recent example of the way that the UK government has just changed the legislation governing <coughs> fracking in that um, until now, house owners have, as you said, owned in the entire political rights below their house. Yeah. They've just changed the legal framework for that to allow fracking companies to go horizontally under people's houses is actually an example of how actually sovereign countries and governments really do control all yeah. resources. Yeah. Yeah, and even in those countries where the, there is, an, you know, in some countries there's actually a constitution that says natural resources belong to the people, and you still see that a lot of the decisions that are made are actually not in the greater interest of the people. Still, the philosophy of Publish What You Pay movement is <coughs> belongs to the people, and hence the government has a responsibility to manage their natural resources in the interest and for the benefit <coughs> of its people. And then I'll take you on a journey that in most cases this is not really what's happening. Yes, yeah, sure. On the topic of people, um, I just would submit since we allow corporations to be considered people, then another would be corporations of the resources. <coughs> <laughs> In some instances, they buy very validly and according to a good bidding process, they buy good licenses. In other instances, it's a bit dodgier. And if you talk to a lot of the African colleagues, they would probably not want to equal corporations with people. You wanted to make a comment as well? People, which people? people? The citizens of... A country? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the citizens of a country. Of course, there's going to be a building of justice in that. Because some countries are rich in resources and others are poor mm -hmm. resources. Mm -hmm. They've not been shared around. Yeah, and, and you would even argue that in, in some countries there's great disparity, disparity in the regions where the extractive resources are being mined versus regions where there is no, no such extraction. Um, we would, in most instances, the Publish What You Pay national coalitions would want to see a little bit more of the revenues going back into the extractive regions because they carry more of the environmental and social burden than other regions does. But however, in Peru, for example, what's been really interesting is that the absorption capacity of states in the extractive regions has been overburdened, and other regions where there is no extraction have become more impoverished as a result of it. So there's a, l a great lack of shared prosperity and, and inclusive, inclusive growth. Okay. 
So let's dive a little bit, or let's dig, let's start digging, let's start extracting the truth um, into Publish What You Pay's Vision 2020. Uh, obviously, there's lots of Vision 2020s out there. It's kind of a catchy name. The Vision 2020 for Publish What You Pay not only refers to the year 2020, but also to the perfect eyesight, which we will get as a result of uh, our transparency efforts. Uh, a perfect uh, light on all the information that will come out of either voluntary mechanisms or mandatory uh, mechanisms which we are campaigning for. Um, we also want to see a world where all citizens benefit from their natural resources, not only today and tomorrow. And obviously when you're talking about gas, oil and mining, uh, gas, oil and minerals, these are non-renewable. So we need to be make very sure uh, that those finite resources are optimally used and that not only the current generations can benefit from them, but also future generations. So some countries have done that quite cleverly, such as Norway, by set setting up a sovereign wealth fund. Um, other countries that are a lot poorer have done it by um, regulating that the revenues from these uh, industries need to be prioritized for poverty reduction uh, and uh, the basic priority sectors such as health and education. So what are we talking about? As you can see, I've listed a couple of uh, quite striking details. We're talking about Equatorial Guinea. Equatorial Guinea has uh, 700,000 people, uh, has an oil wealth that is enormous, and has a president that has plundered that oil wealth for just his and his family use. I don't know if you've heard of President Obiang's son, who's currently being, I think, indicted in the US uh, for um, using um, oil wealth for his personal gain. Um, he's an official minister in uh, Equatorial Guinea. He earns $6,000 uh, a month in Equatorial Guinea. Yet he manages to amass yards worth over $200 million. Houses in Malibu, in Paris that are even worth more than that. And as a really silly side uh, detail, paraphernalia such as the glove of Michael Jackson. Um, so that's one striking um, case. Yet 700,000 people are living on uh, less than two dollars a day. So Equatorial is really the ultimate example of how a country has not used its oil wealth um, to benefit I its people. The other case we see on the right is Niger. Uh, uranium in Niger. Uh, Ur Niger is actually the fourth largest world producer of uranium after Canada, Australia and Kazakhstan. Um, Niger provides one third of the electricity needs to France. Every third bulb, light bulb in France is lighted by uranium from Niger. Yet only 10% of the people in Niger have access to electricity. And it is estimated that over a period of 50 years, more than $20 billion uh, uh, in revenues has been lost due to a very bad deal with Areva, the French nuclear giant. It's a state-owned company. And they managed to negotiate with the government of Niger in 1968, just so eight years after they became independent, a stabilization clause for 75 years. Uh, can you imagine that you would be in a job and actually negotiate or your employer wants you to set your salary for like 10 years without any due, uh, any uh, consideration for your changing situations or con uh, changing context? A stabilization clause for 75 years. So that to me is, is remarkable. Then we have another case on the left, um, which is a really interesting one in Nigeria. Um, Nigeria, um, some interesting statistics. Um, in 2011 alone, received $68 billion in, uh, in oil revenues. Yet, 
65% of the Nigerians live below the poverty line. Striking case of corruption in this instance is a, a, a deal that was signed between um, Shell and the former Minister of Oil, Etita, in Nigeria for an amount of over a bill. I see someone's nodding, I'm quite familiar with this case, for an amount over a billion dollars. This amount just was a deal signed between Shell and his former Minister of Oil. And this deal just happened to come up to another lawsuit in New York. It didn't come up from a, a regular disclosure requirement by Shell or in their sort of uh, consolidated accounts on an annual basis. <coughs> Um, and so hence we want really companies uh, to open up uh, these books. Um, then on the right side below is a case of Kyrgyzstan where you have a, a Canadian uh, company, Santerra Gold, um, a C Canadian uh, gold uh, mine company. It has the biggest gold mine in Kyrgyzstan in Central Asia um, and their communities are not seeing any benefits from, uh, from their natural resources, from their, their gold uh, through a very bad deal. Uh, and hence what you see here is that communities have started taking um, to the street to, to protest and to block access for Santerra Gold uh, to the mine. There's a really interesting study that has come out uh, out of Harvard University that really looked at quantifying the cost of conflict for the extractive industry. And it's really in the, the company's interest to have very good relationships both with the government but equally if not more important with the communities living close to the extraction. So that's the, the, the extent of the problem that we're dealing with. Um, another interesting statistic is that one in five citizens living on less than $2 a day come from uh, countries rich in natural resources. So it's really the, the resource curse or the paradox of plenty uh, comes uh, to life. And then another one that I will end with is that development aid dwarfs the whole extractive industry um, uh, revenues. And in 2010 alone, the revenue streams were from the extractive industry were 10 times overseas development assistance. So really, if these resources are used very wisely, equitably, and responsibly, countries can say no to donor aid and, and wean off development aid uh, entirely. So we see ourselves, Publish What You Pay really sees itself as a civil society uh, oversight actor. Um, I've already actually discussed this. We're now over 800 organizations strong, mainly in the South. So what started as sort of a UK-driven, a UK-based initiative, very quickly mushroomed to um, developing countries and civil society organizations. They're jumping on the opportunity uh, to start extracting the truth. Um, and it's really important. It's very hard work still because you have a lot of local civil society organizations that are being intimidated both by government or by um, uh, the, the industry itself. So they're seeking a lot of solidarity from Publish What You Pay as well. We still have intimidations, we have arrests, um, we have continuous harassment and we bring the spotlight and provide uh, solidarity for, for our activists. And as you say, as I said before, our slogan is really extracting the truth. We want uh, to open the books and make sure that those revenues are used and then used to hold both governments as well as industries accountable uh, for um, their actions. So how do we do that? Um, who has heard of the EITI? Okay. Do you want to, sir, do you want to explain what it is? I just know of the... Uh, okay. Oh yeah. Um, so of course that is also an extractive yes. uh, yeah. former colleague of mine at uh, Mosul X based in Switzerland who's actually working in Niger on ah. uh, human rights uh, yeah. establishments of uh, groundwater. Yeah, and it's a big problem in the north of Niger, yeah. Yeah. Okay, who can tell me the little bit about the EITI? Yeah, okay. Uh, well I was going to ask you what the overlap was between publishing what you pay and the EITI, because they look like very similar things yeah. to me. I'm not kind of EITI, as far as I know, is an international kind of, um, uh, uh, I don't know what the right word is, coalition framework, mm -hmm. a sort of governance framework for uh, 
uh, corporations and um, governments to kind of have expectations about uh, disclosure in terms of payments uh, kind of between governments and corporations. So it covers all extractive industries. And I know it's um, chaired by Claire Short. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm a board member, so I work oh, with Claire Short. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Anyone else wants to add? It's actually, you're completely right. It's a multi-stakeholder initiative between governments, civil society and industry to advance good governance in the sector. It's a voluntary initiative, so it depends very much on, on the government signing on. Uh, and Tony Blair was the one who announced it in 2002 as part of the World Summit on Sustainable Development in Johannesburg. Um, it's now implemented in, in 48 countries and the UK is now also doing it domestically. It's very interesting. Okay, and I will explain a little bit what the relationship is between Publisher JP and EITI because it's a very interesting one. Um, the other way we're doing it um, is here on uh, the top is um, through regulations. We want um, regu mandatory disclosures. We want actually a regulatory framework that obliges all the extractive companies to publish all their payments to governments. And not only at a country level, so at a higher aggregate level, but also at a project level. So that citizens really can start tracking the money, which is very important for communities living close to the extraction. I don't know if you've heard of the Dodd-Frank Section 1504 Act that was adopted by Congress in 2010. Uh, and that was a, a groundbreaking piece of legislation that really Publish What You Pay has sort of galvanized and has sort of used uh, to harness uh, and to get more support worldwide for the mandatory disclosures. Um, four years later, we're still, well, it's almost five years later now, we're still protecting that piece of legislation because what happened in those four years is that the American Petroleum Institute, the biggest lobby body of the industry, uh, litigated against Dodd-Frank Section 1504 and uh, the courts last year um, forced the, the regulatory body, the Securities and Exchange Commission, to go back to the drawing board. So that's unfortunately uh, the situation today. <laughs> Yet, um, Dodd-Frank, as it stands, still exists. It's still a, a law, it's just the guidance rules that need to be revised. What is interesting though is that Dot Frank led to a whole um, uh, train of other um, countries that jumped on the mandatory disclosures uh, bandwagon. Um, in 2013, as a result of a, a, a European-wide and global campaign of Publish What You Pay coalitions in Europe and beyond, um, the European Parliament in June 2013 adopted a piece of legislation that was inspired by Dodd-Frank Section 1504, but went a bit further. In the EU Accounting and Transparency Directive, every listed and large non-listed extractive company needs to publish their payments also on a country and a, a project level. And it's not only gas, oil and mining companies in the EU, but it's also forestry, because obviously forestry goes also with its own set of transparency challenges. <coughs> um, the UK was a champion in this piece of legislation and made it its core agenda in, at uh, the G8 Love Earn um, Summit, uh, the, tax transparency, the tax trade and transparency agenda. And we've been working very, very closely with the UK government um, on bringing about more transparency transparency in, in this sector. Um, so that's now 28, yes, question. All their taxes, royalties, subsidies, all their payments to governments. So for a license, they have to um, um, uh, publish their license payments, their royalties, the taxes, uh, in some instances, security payments. So th those are all the payments, not for subcontractors. So it's really about the government or the payments between governments and uh, the companies. Does that answer your question? Good. Okay. Sorry, can I just ask where do they have to publish that information? That's a, a very good question. Um, in the UK, it has to go through Companies House. Um, and we're working on developing a central database because this is uh, quite a big challenge, uh, is that it doesn't necessarily all have to be open data. Our, our negotiation power 
didn't result in getting an open data requirement, which we really wanted. Um, so now we are actually working with uh, individual EU member states to make sure that the data is open as well as accessible to a central database. So in the UK, that's guaranteed. It's going to go to companies' house. Yeah, but in other member states, that's a bit challenging, uh, and we we don't want to have many different databases that are not actually corresponding with each other, or even worse, have PDFs. And this is, for example, what happened in the EITI. We ended up with a lot of national level EITI reports that were in the form of a PDF, which makes comparison of data, doing deeper analysis, practically impossible. And so it's, so we learned from that lesson and we were like, okay, in this day and age of technology, there's no reason why we can't publish that data on an, on an open database. In the Dodd-Frank legislation, it is actually an open data requirement. Okay. This explains very nicely what the relationship is between the EITI and Publish What You Pay. Is it a love-hate relationship? Yeah. <laughs> um, I always like to remind governments, particularly the more challenging government, that it was in response to a publish what you pay ask that the EITI was established. It was really like civil society asking for this voluntary initiative. And actually it was almost a compromise because we wanted it mandatory. We wanted mandatory disclosures, and it's always been our aim to go for the regulatory approach. Yet the EITI was sort of the soft, multi-stakeholder voluntary uh, response that came out of it. However, in a lot of countries, it's groundbreaking in the sense that it's for the first time that civil society has direct access to both policymakers and industry to sit around the table and advance uh, resource uh, governance. Implemented in 48 countries, um, including the US and the UK, they are now um, uh, candidate countries, and France and Germany have committed. So, and Norway is also on there. So, and the, even Australia did a pilot project. So, it's no longer the North telling the South what to do, but also recognizing that Northern uh, problems may have challenges around their resource governance that can be addressed through a, a multi stakeholder approach. So, we play a sort of a, a watchdog role on the EITI. Um, so we coordinate the civil society constituency on the international board. And they, they don't all have to be published what you pay members. It's open. We organize every couple of years, we organize elections. So anyone can come in who wants to be on the EITI international board. Although I can tell you it's a lot of work and it's not always the most uh, exciting because it's always seeking the consensus and doing a lot of negotiation. And uh, at national level, a lot of the Publish What You Pay national coalitions also have a seat uh, on the national multi-stakeholder groups. And so we push the initiative along. It's really, um, uh, in 2013, an, a new standard was adopted by the EITI that went a lot further than just revenue disclosures, because it's a learning process also for us. We felt you know, revenue disclosures are, was sort of the, the key solution to help resolve the resource curse, but there's a lot of other elements that also need to be looked at, particularly at the licensing round, but also at the public financial management side, because it's one thing to be transparent about your revenues, but if they don't end up being uh, managed well through a, a good public financial management approach, then what's the point? I mean, we really want to make sure those revenues are, are used. Um, we support the initiative. Uh, we are a big supporter of the EITI, but also see significant weaknesses. And I just want to find out from you if you, based on what you may have read, on based on what you've told, what I've told you, what are some of those weaknesses? Yes. Mm. So, um, would it be fair to say that 
feasible to say you've got published in the paper, what about published in the paper? Yeah, I'll show you a little bit what we have actually done because you raise a really interesting point. Um, it's also having a much more in-depth discussion on whether to go for the extraction or not. Does it always make sense to go for the extraction or does it in some instances, is it better to leave the stuff in the ground? So I'll show you a little bit later what we've done with that because we want to have a much more broader cost-benefit analysis of whether to go ahead with the extraction or not. But in most instances, and this is really interesting, like for example, the civil society in Iraq, where 95% of the government revenues come from oil, to propose to civil society that they should leave the stuff in the ground, to them is a big no-go. So it's a huge uh, debate within civil society worldwide, yes? Could I just add, it, it, it was shown if this was kept in the ground, the soil was kept intact, okay. and actually, we're not talking about um, crops which are just for growing food and destructive fuel, mm -hmm. but crops which give it multiple uh, purposes, mm -hmm. and it's part of biodiversity, it's not a uh, monoculture. If, if there was a case to be shown for that, then it would incentivize those indigenous or people in that area. Would that Yes and no. I saw a couple of other hands. Um, yes, you go. Um, I think the weakness is that I mean the companies, the main companies, conglomerates which are going to take up the ITR are probably going to be leaders in the field. Mm -hmm. Therefore, a they're probably expected by their finances, banks, and society to actually join us. Yeah. But also you've got the finance to actually be able to administer this kind of initiative, whereas you've got the smaller uh, ones, mm -hmm. which probably aren't going to be well developed, it's not even the finance that they can, and maybe there isn't that much attention. We all hear about the large ones, yeah. but to a certain extent they're probably a little more responsible than the smaller ones. Yeah. That's it, yeah. Uh, although I have to say, you're right, because actually at the international level, you have over 80 supporting companies that have officially signed on to the EITI principles, and they pay uh, a membership fee or sort of a, based on, the, on their income, it's a sliding scale. But once a government signs on to the EITI at national level, all the companies operated operating in that jurisdiction have to report their payments. And that is simply a matter of filling out a template. Do you mean in the region, or do you mean the, the company's subsidiaries operating in that region? All the companies that are operating in within a government, within a national jurisdiction, if the country signs on to the EITI, they have to report. Yeah, and whether it's a subsidiary or not, doesn't matter. If they're operating there, they have to report. I saw some other hands, other weaknesses. Well, so yeah. I asked about the robustness of the reporting. Mm -hmm. so you can actually check, you know, whether these figures are meaningful. Or so. mm -hmm. It is a major issue. It is a major issue, although in the EITI standard, um, the reconciler actually have to work with figures that have been audited. Um, and obviously with the companies that's actually much <laughs> easier to do than with some of the governments. And then you also see a dis uh, quite a big difference between francophone auditing uh, standards as well as anglophone auditing standards. So yes, you're right, it's not as easy to do. And in some instances, the reconciliation reports, those are the annual reports, are 700, 1,000 pages. Climate change agenda now with the reporting and verification agenda same issues, you know, in, in uh, developing states and you know, developed states actually reporting robust figures yeah. on that. So, you know, it's a similar kind of yeah. issue. Yeah. Any other potential weaknesses? Yes. Well, no. Could you just tell a bit more about the <coughs> linkages between those initiatives and the civil society? Because you said, well, civil society is supposed to be well, the one who holds the government's accounts, mm -hmm. right? But uh, if you have a authoritarian or neo-patrimonial regimes, you know, how do you really keep them accountable? Isn't it that that's really a major gap that it's fine for the companies to publish? It's, okay, so yeah. Even though they publish, it makes sense and it's true. I mean, I don't know if that's really such a big issue now. Uh -huh. But 
you know, this information is just out there and what's really next. Yeah. And you said that, you know, you declare some sort of solidarity with also the civil society group. Yeah. Also, so perhaps you could also actually say more how you, you know, locate them, right? Mm. I mean, so who is the civil society group? Mm. Because, I mean, that's really for me, mm. the problem I tend to okay. grasp. Okay, so Publish What You Pay is only civil society. Yeah? We are the civil society movement, while the EITI is multi-stakeholder. So those are, that's already a major distinction. Um, so within Publish What You Pay, we have identified civil society as all those stakeholders that are outside of the political atmosphere and out of outside of the private sector. So it includes from small community-based organizations to faith-based groups, environmental groups, church groups, uh, bigger NGOs, uh, um, academia, think tanks, research, research groups, they all sign up to publish what you pay. So that's sort of... And then empowering the process. Yes, exactly. Um, and the EIT, we use the EITI as a major tool to advance our asks, to advance our advocacy asks. So we see the EITI as a means to an end rather than an end in itself. But you raise the most critical weakness is around very authoritarian regimes um, because there's a quite a, a major step um, in the theory of change that automatically if you have more transparency it would lead to accountability and this is the one more million dollar question at the moment because that automatic link is not so automatic. Uh, yes. And, and that's really, really very tricky question that we're dealing with at the moment uh, within the EITI board. For example, we have Azerbaijan. Uh, Azerbaijan was the first EITI compliant country. And they've used the EITI really, in my opinion, um, as a PR exercise, as a whitewashing exercise. And civil society benefited from that as well, obviously, because they managed to get more information that they could use to stimulate a debate. Yet you would hope that from more openness um, you can create more debates, uh, you can start asking more questions from decision makers, uh, you can have make informed decisions about changing policies and changing practices, and you can start asking questions what happened to those revenues in the budget. And this is where precisely that, uh, in some instances, that's not really possible. And Azerbaijan is the ultimate example of where that is not possible, because the government is organizing a crackdown on the space for civil society to ask those questions. Um, through increased legislation that restricts civic space, increased legislation, um, increased bureaucracy for civil society to operate. And so that is the big question that we're struggling with at the EITI board at the moment. And Azerbaijan is just because it's now in the limelight, but there's obviously quite a few other countries where this is a problem. So transparency is a safe concept because it's just putting out information in the public domain. However, when citizens are starting to use that information, that's where it gets uncomfortable for, for quite a few uh, governments. I saw another hand. Yes, yeah. I have a question about the, the natural resources part. Mm -hmm. You mentioned oil, uh, gas, and mining. What about water? It's not included in the EITI uh, mandate. Um, they limited it to um, extractive resources, so really gas, oil and minerals. Although in some countries they have added other natural resources that play a significant role, such as uh, in Liberia they've added forestry, and now in Mauritania they added fisheries. So yeah, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So um, how does your approach compare to parallel processes like Principles and mm. Are you working with them? These more IND and these transgovernmental INGO approaches, or how would you place yourselves in relation to? We're trying to, but we have such a small secretariat that we don't really have a lot of capacity to engage in a lot of other uh, uh, um, uh, prints because the EITI and the mandatory disclosures campaign has, has takes so much of our time. Um, I know I'm aware of them, uh, but I don't en engage as much as I would like to. So yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but a lot of the Publish What You Pay members do, but it's not something that at the International Secretariat of Publish What You Pay we engage in. I saw another hand. Um, no? 
Okay. The other, to me, the most critical weakness of the EITI is that it's a voluntary um, initiative. So it depends a lot on the political will of a country to engage. And so a country like Angola, based on which the whole Publish What You Pay campaign was in a way founded, they've never signed on to the EITI. Equatorial Guinea and Gabon both got kicked out because of a lack of, of commitment. So that to me, that voluntary element is, uh, is a major, major weakness. Although as a response to that, what you see in more and more countries, countries are coming up with a, an EITI law to enshrine uh, sort of the, the mechanism into a, a stronger legal framework. As I said, in the response to this uh, voluntary initiative, we've really focused on the, on the mandatory disclosures. I've already talked about Dodd-Frank uh, section 1504, um, and that's highly disaggregated and much more timely. Another weakness of the EITI is that you're actually talking about two-year-old data. So for 2014, you're talking about data from 2012. So for planning and budget purposes, as well as for financial management purposes, and for the accountability component, it's quite old data. Well, with the mandatory disclosures, we're really talking about, uh, well, maximum one year old uh, data. I talked about the EU transparency and accounting directives. Um, we're now in the transposition phase. Um, basically, EU member states have up to two years to transpose EU directives into national law. Uh, so by latest November of this year, all the work needs to be done. UK and France have been champions, so they've already transposed into um, international law. And Norway, as a not an EU member, but as a key ally, uh, they mainly follow a lot of the EU directives and they've already adopted uh, a similar law that came into force as of January 2014. So this, mm, actually next week, um, we will start seeing the first financial information coming out of these directives in, in Norway. And that's very interesting because Stat Oil is a major player in, in this field. Canada is working on regulations. It's really one of the key mining giants um, and that's coming out of their, their G8 or now G7 law earned commitments as well. In Australia, uh, in October last year, um, we have the first published Richard Pay bill, um, and that was also based on the, on the EU directives. And what's interesting in Switzerland, not exactly your shining light of transparency, um, there's even some movement with uh, commodity trading, which plays a huge role in, in the sector. Um, and to, to potentially come up with a law that would provide transparency for, for all the trading that goes on for Glencore and Trafigura. And that would be groundbreaking because Glencore does not play the most transparent role uh, in this field. So a little bit about what we do, because you asked what do we actually do. Um, I call ourselves global activists, so we really want to use globalization as well as local um, localization uh, and that sort of interdependency of the publisher GP movement is a, a, a force it's a it's a very important element in our uh, in in our work so what you see here on the left is a stunt we did um, in front of the Securities and Exchange Commission on Valentine's Day two years ago, um, where we were, uh, well, you can see already who's out there or in bed together, ExxonMobil, the oil companies red with the regulators, they're in bed together and they're interested in let's keep our little love affair secret. And this was at the height of the campaign where we were seeing a lot of collision between uh, the companies and, and the government. And so we wanted to shine a light in a fun way way on, on this phenomenon. On the right we did the same uh, in Houston in front of all the headquarters of um, uh, the, the big oil companies and we said transparency is not monkey business. So again that was sort of a fun way to, uh, to get some media attention. And then I was talking already about the Areva uh, Niger case. Um, there was a historic opportunity uh, starting in 2013 when um, the uh, 10 year sort of agreement between Areva and, and Niger came up for renegotiation. And in that time, um, Niger had changed both its constitution as well as its mining code. And it's changed its constitution to really 
enshrine revenue and contract transparency. So it's now a constitutional obligation that all contracts and all revenues need to be published. Um, and plus, it's also in the constitution that natural resources belong to the people and revenues from those resources need to be spent on priority sectors such as health, education and agriculture. Um, so civil society saw this as a key opportunity to push for only one thing that the constitution was respected as well as the mining code was respected and the mining code uh, really meant a doubling of the revenues uh, from um, the deal with Areva and Areva was protesting left right and center uh, in the end a deal was signed but Unfortunately, Niger is violating its constitution by not publishing uh, the contract yet. So that's something that civil society is now pushing for again. And we might, in solidarity with the Publish What You Pay chapter in Niger, actually start a case against the Niger government uh, to make sure that those contracts are published. Until the, the contract is published, we cannot make an assessment whether it was a fair deal of, or not. The only thing the government is saying, and Areva are saying, we're abiding by the mining code or, or, and the constitution of Niger. Um, what they did, however, was um, they mobilized communities really around a couple of very key data sets that they got from the EITI. So again, this is a really interesting way of how using data can lead to really cool advocacy efforts. Um, the EITI report from Niger basically showed that um, the extractive industry made up more than 70% of the export value of Niger, yet it contributed less than 5% uh, to Niger's GDP. And they felt this discrepancy was just not good enough, uh, it was just unacceptable. So they organized a whole range of, of debates. They mobilized artists in Niger to uh, come up with innovative and nice catchy songs. And they had a, a march uh, in December of 2013, um, basically saying no to the stabilization clause for 75 years. Uh, Areva, you need to respect um, uh, the law rather than make the law. And the stabilization clause was valid until 2043. So civil society in Niger said no, no longer. So what are some recent developments? Who has been following the um, high level panel of Tabon Beki on illicit financial flows? No? Just came out a report. Really interesting. If you're interested in, in sort of the whole tax justice, uh, the role extractive industries plays in this, um, Tabon Beki led a high level panel for two years and they looked at um, what is extracted from Africa in terms of illicit financial flows. And I just got a press release from, from earlier this, this month. Africa is losing more than $50 billion every year in illicit financial outflows as governments and multinational companies engage in fraudulent schemes aimed at avoiding tax payments to some of the world's poorest countries. And the extractive industry plays a very, very negative, negative role in this. Um, then you have in Africa itself the African Mining Vision. And the African Mining Vision is a, a vision that was adopted by all the ministers at the African Union. And that's the overall framework for the mining sector and really linking for the first time, linking mining to development. Uh, it's a beautiful document uh, and civil society is using it quite extensively. Unfortunately, it hasn't led to the domestication or the national take up of this document. The countries that are very progressive on this are Guinea, for example, um, as well as the Democratic Republic of, of the Congo. So as I, I already told you a little bit, I want to sh show you what um, sort of civil society actors have managed to achieve thanks to a lot of campaigning and advocacy, negotiation, uh, as well as organizing debates. I uh, talked about Niger already. Uh, Guinea had a change in government. A new government is very interested in making sure uh, that their revenues are spent for sustainable development. Um, they now publish all their contracts. Um, online. There is a portal, an online portal, where their contracts are uh, published and they did a review of all their contracts and as a result of that they actually um, put a moratorium on 
on on the con on new contracts in in Guinea because they wanted um, really a much better regulatory framework um, and uh, better contracts, better deals for uh, for their country. In Côte d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, uh, there's a new mining code, uh, and that new mining code really links or includes uh, a lot more uh, transparency clauses. And then Congo Brazzaville, um, I, I realize I talk quite a bit about Francophone Africa, uh, an initiative to introduce a domestic revenue a transparency law, so domesticating the EITI process. To me, the biggest impact, we've been going now for 12 years, is that publisher you pay or civil society is now really seen as a credible actor in this sector. We're being listened to, um, we get a lot of media attention, uh, and transparency uh, is now sort of a mainstream um, component of, of, uh, of the extractive uh, sector. As we say, transparency is out of the ghetto and into mainstream uh, development. But still, we're halfway there. We're not fully there yet and it's still I find uh, it's a big fight it's not a given and we uh, need to remain vigilant uh, about um, uh, the transparency elements so I already talked about this a little bit but let me just um, try and highlight this a bit more um, thanks to the very detailed revenue transparency laws um, that we've brought about um, we're covering about 75 to 80 percent of the total market value of the extractive industry. So really, we'll get an unprecedented level of, of, of transparency. What's also interesting is that we're learning along the way. You know, we thought revenue transparency, that was really the solution for helping to resolve the resource curse. Maybe slightly naive, but we've, you know, and you find that if you get revenue transparency on the table, the corruption and the bad deals and the cracks start appearing elsewhere. Um, so thanks to two years of very hard negotiating uh, and a lot of campaigning, the EITI adopted a new standard in 2013 in May 2013 uh, and that provides a lot more information than just revenues. Um, uh, now revenues have to be highly disaggregated. If you look for example at the report of Azerbaijan, uh, the EITI report, it only had five pages and it was very highly aggregated. It basically showed a lump sum that the government <laughs> or that the companies had paid and a lump sum that the government had received. It wasn't even disaggregated by companies, so it became impossible for civil society to use that information. <laughs> The other elements that are um, required is a license registry, license allocation, so really about open bid bidding processes and making sure who owns what license. That now has to be included. Subnational transfers. I already talked about that in quite a few countries there are policies around revenue sharing. Um, so communities may uh, be entitled to, let's say, uh, 1 to 15, between 1 to 15 percent of the revenues to be used for local development. If that is required by law, those uh, transfers have to be included in the EITI report. Then, as I said as well, you can be completely transparent about your revenues, uh, but oh, if they don't lead to better public financial management, we're still back to square one. Um, so in the EITI reports, there needs to be very clear mention of where the revenues are going into uh, the budget. And if there are specific sectors, uh, it also needs to be included, as well as if there are sovereign wealth funds, that has to be broken down too. The elements that we really wanted as a requirement and we didn't get, so that's our next campaign, is contract transparency. This is an encouraged element in the EITI standard. We feel for talking about public resources that need to be managed for the public good as a natural um, element or natural uh, next step is that contracts between uh, for those public goods should also be out in the public domain. And then the whole issue around beneficial ownership is also a key factor to help facilitate corruption and we want the ultimate beneficial owners to be made public and we didn't get that that's only an encouragement in the EITI um, uh, standard so I wanted to say um, that we 
as publish what you pay, we've got also, as I mentioned before, we have our own um, uh, strategy called our Vision 2020. And in that, we have developed a value chain for and from a citizen's perspective. We try and make the sector accessible and fun as well, which is quite hard to do because it's quite a technocratic uh, sector that's not easily understandable, particularly for civil society groups close to the extraction or working uh, in a, an area with low educational uh, standards. So we've come up with a, an, uh, a value chain called the Chain for Change. And in there, we basically explain in 12 easy steps what we want an open and accountable extractive industry to look like. And going back to your question, in there, there's big recognition for a much more informed debate and cost benefit analysis, including all the environmental and social uh, cost and benefits to decide whether to extract or not. Um, and that's something that we really want to see a lot more of. It's happening in some countries, like for example in Bolivia, um, Parliament has to approve any extractive investment, and there they have they are going quite in depth into the cost benefits. Yes, yeah. Mm. He said that if you're going to come into my third country, take all the minerals that I can't farm, and then you leave. Mm. So he said that the United Nations meeting, and he's the only person I think so far who's been brave enough to actually stand up not to conventional energy, but renewable energy purposes. Fair point. But the whole, sort of, they call it resource nationalism. I don't necessarily agree with that term, but you see it more and more in other countries now coming up as well. People are much sort of asking more questions about, okay, what do we do with our natural resources? So, and I think that's a very healthy, healthy development. So this is basically our new strategy in, in four uh, strategic uh, pillars. So we have published why you pay and how you extract. And that's really about all the steps prior to revenue transparency. Obviously, our traditional pillar, publish what you pay, um, is still out there because we were not there yet. The third pillar is really about uh, moving from transparency to accountability, publish what you earn and how you spend. And then we have a last pillar, which is mentioned on this little thing, is publish what you learn. And that really has to be, uh, is talking about all the steps about decommissioning, um, dismantling projects, because there's a lot of bad governance around dismantling and decommissioning sites, and also doing a bit of learning. Has, th has there been a good cost-benefit benef analysis after the project has ended that would then feed maybe into back into the first step of the chain for change around publish why you pay and how you extract a, a much better regulatory uh, framework. This is, again, um, trying to make the sector a little bit more accessible, a bit more fun. So we had a cartoonist um, at our 10th anniversary looking at translating all the debates into, into fun cartoons. Um, and one thing that <laughs> we're very, very conscious about is next year, as a result of all these mandatory disclosures, we're finally going to get all this um, information out in the open. The EU directives 2016 is going to be the first uh, uh, bit of first round of information, or first round of data, and we need to be ready for this so-called data avalanche and really start using it because there is a, a review clause in 2018, and if we can't show to the world that we've used the data actively, I'm sure the industry is going to come back <laughs> and say, why are we doing this? Um, and then looking again at the question, or are you doing enough to follow the money? Revenue transparency is one thing. If it doesn't lead to better public financial management, that's a whole other ball game. And on that note, I thank you. This was a picture at our 10th anniversary where 250 of our activists came together in an old gas factory in Amsterdam. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a fascinating movement. It's the best job I've ever had, but it's also taken over my entire life. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thanks, Marika, for this.
this uh, very interesting conversation we could have with you. Yeah. Transparency on uh, where does it stand today, the whole movement, mm. how does it work with friends and competitors like EITI, and uh, how you look forward to what you call the 2020 perspective. Uh, we still have a couple of minutes left okay, good. for further discussion with you. Yeah. Uh, I might just ask you to raise your hand like you, and then we just go ahead. Yes. yes. Hi, um, thank you for that. That was really interesting to get a kind of inside forward look as to what's happening in EITI and Finish Work UK. Uh, I'm just trying to reconcile the, the idea of um, what you do as a post hoc exercise, because mm. reporting by its nature is kind of, it comes after the event, doesn't mm. it? And it seems a very big leap to think that that will, uh, or a, I don't know, a hopeful leap to think that this will move into a kind of um, a facilitate better sustainability or mm -hmm. more uh, democracy around uh, the release of resources. Um, so uh, I guess a couple of questions. So the first one is, do you think it's a fair statement to say that this, this kind of initiative is more about um, uh, sort of uh, accountability in governments rather than uh, environmental governments? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Can I quickly respond to that already? Yeah, because that's really interesting. Like, for example, in Latin America, the civil society um, in Latin America wants to push for including environmental governance into the EITI standard. It's always important. I explain the EITI standard as the floor rather than the ceiling, and the EITI domestically has to be made fit for purpose. So, in the UK EITI, we had hoped for even a debate more on fracking you know the incentives for fracking or maybe even a debate around you know like the the, the peak of the, the the revenues in the north sea uh, the longer term perspectives of those revenues for the north sea um, new resources that are coming up in the yorkshire parks so really the eiti is what you make of it domestically and how well uh, civil society is interested in in the initiative so for latin america they're setting up this year a campaign of including including transparency elements of the environment. So not necessarily looking at carbon emissions, but looking at subsidies for um, uh, fracking, uh, more transparency there, or looking at um, environmental impact assessments that are part of the contract and that are often not First of all, those uh, environmental impact assessments are not being made public, so uh, civil society doesn't really know what companies are committing themselves to in terms of environmental impact mitigation. And then, um, secondly, they they want to be the civil society wants to hold those environmental impact um, commitments to account, or they want the industry and governments to hold those uh, both those parties to account for for those. That's really interesting. Yeah. The idea of sourcing has been hugely influential in Scotland and mobilised ah. science around renewable energy. Aha. So one of the, the, argue, the, the more prevailing arguments now is kind of moved away from the idea of safety and, and aesthetics into the idea of subsidy as a kind of. Ah, we need to talk then a bit. Of, of that industry. Um, yes, yeah, so you kind of answered my second question, which was um, in, in terms of envisaging the mobilisation of civil society that might be able to hold kind of individual sites to account. Do you see that as your role or do you hope that that will be something that's taken up by a wider civil society? Yeah, I always hope it's taken up by wider civil society. I mean, Publish What You Pay can only do so, so much. Um, quite a few of the national Publish What You Pay coalitions are including um, are, and are linking to other coalitions to make a bigger groundswell. Yeah. Yeah, you wanted to come back? Yeah? yeah I wanted to ask, um, with regards to, aside from the oil and the coal and the gas, mm -hmm. Over the mineral side, what are the minerals coming up? And also, clarity to the other 
the sources of materials for these renewable technologies. Mm. You probably have to ask an expert in the room because I'm not an expert on renewable um, energy. Other minerals that we're yeah, other minerals that we're looking at are obviously diamonds, uh, jade, um, coltrane, um, yeah, all the, the the minerals that are used for for uh, for extract for extractive purposes. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. The question you raised is certainly interesting because it's one of these say misperceptions, contradictions to consider renewable energy as green, independent from uh, all they have been okay. produced in the supply chain. Uh, okay. So minerals, we should certainly speak about, mm. are partly critical, mm. so critical materials such as lithium, uh, but uh, also yeah. platinum, but uh. also a number of base metals. You need steel, which means iron ore. You need uh, bauxite, which then translates into aluminium. Uh, you also need lots of copper, and all estimations I have seen Fantastic. for no pathways mean you need more copper than you need in business as usual scenarios. Okay. From that perspective, mm. of course, the energy and water intensive process of extracting copper wherever, mm. be it in the southern part of Congo or be it in Chile or wherever, is critically important. Yes. And uh, mm. indeed, well, as long as we, or, well, the more we look into transparency mm. and carbon flow accounting, we also need to look at that at least environmental impact assessment is done wherever uh, um, That's interesting. these minerals are taken out of the ground. That yeah. should be part of any picture, yeah. part of a wider cost-benefit analysis. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah. What about out of the sea? Deep sea mining, uh, yeah, yeah, Papua New Guinea as well, yeah, and Papua New Guinea activists are very much against it, yeah, yeah. Is there, is it that? Is it the same mechanism? Yeah, there would be. Papua New Guinea has now signed up to the EITI, so it would be really curious to find out if they're including including those payments as well that are going on between. I assume they have to, and it's something that surely local civil society wants to see. But I'm going to write it down. I'm going to check that one. Uh. Okay. You publish late and what do you see as the key factor? Do you have a sort of ratio, a key ratio for amount of natural resources distributed to the maximum? You know who does that is a Natural Resource Governance Institute, the old Revenue Watch Institute. They're sort of the key technical powerhouse in sort of the transparency and accountability field. And they produce the so-called Resource Governance Index and they look at all those uh, uh, data and reference points. The latest one they did was 2013, but I think there's a new one coming out and it's available online. And they look at all the resource rich countries um, and how they're doing on the, on the various indicators. Source governance. In so the website is resourcegovernance.org. So. Yeah, but they have an office here in London as well. They're a member of Publish. They're one of the founding, involved in the foundation of Publish Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do you get all the help that you need from academia? No. Um, I asked the question <laughs> because um, I've been arguing for about about 40 years um. that we need a revolution. Our universities. Um, we've inherited from the past this idea that the basic aim is to acquire knowledge and mm. apply knowledge to mm. solve social problems. But if we take seriously the idea that academia is all about helping to promote human welfare, mm. then the basic problems ought to be problems of living. Mm. And um, if, if that was the idea, if what I call wisdom inquiry would apply, mm. then academia wouldn't actually be doing it, would long be doing what, what you've been doing. Um, no, we don't see it enough, so welcome. <laughs> Come and join. <laughs> no, you're right. Um, in quite a few of the... 
I mean, it's also we don't do we don't reach out to academia enough either. I do I do a lot of reading, and I use all the uh, as much as possible the scientific articles for my advocacy, um, backing it up with data, backing it up with good evidence. But we don't have enough close collaboration with academia. Um, so definitely, I would be very interested in discussing that okay, that more. Also, yeah, well, I guess this is an, is an example. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, I would love to. Yeah. Opportunities would also be to engage with students. Yeah, I would love to. People like like you and me yeah. also ask the students to look at the mountain of documents yeah. that's likely to come in the next year yeah. and stick young academic noses into this. Oh, that'll be fantastic. And work with local civil society too. Yeah, no, I agree. Which is fantastic, yes? Yeah. Um, to, to what extent, you know, is, is the Hulu initiative a kind of problem from the failure of kind of international negotiations to, you know, a carbon negotiations to, um, you know, restrict coal, uh, coal, oil, gas? In a sense, you know, if those negotiations had been more effective, Mm -hmm. There probably would not have been a need for this, in a way. And mm. as a corollary to that, mm. is to what extent are you um, kind of liaising with the Hoover Monitoring and Verification Reporting mm -hmm. initiatives as part of COP21 mm. or whatever it is in Paris? It's, yeah, to be very honest, we don't engage with them enough. And it's such a difficult question for Publish What You Pay, because I personally believe um, we should have a much more informed debate on whether to support a lot of extraction and really have an informed debate uh, whether to go for it. However, the way that is, uh, it is now presented in Africa geopolitically, it's a very sensitive issue. Um, because all these recent discoveries uh, that have been made of the coast of East Africa, of the coast of West Africa, are really presented as the key opportunity for domestic resource mobilization. Um, and you know, and in a particular declining development aid climate, this is presented as the key alternative. Um, I'm hoping that because of the plummeting oil prices, there's going to be much more of a debate around it. Because to me, it's not always obvious that countries should go for ultimate extraction. And but if you look at the IMF, if you look at the World Bank, if you look at sort of all these, you know, all the bilaterals and multilaterals, they're encouraging countries to extract. And and if they all go for extraction, we're going to be beyond the 2.5 degree. Yeah. And so, yeah. So as, as a civil society movement, where we also say, like, you know, not necessarily always go for the extraction. But if you do go for the extraction, at least optimize your revenues and getting a fair deal. It is quite depressing when you look at IEA forecasts for the next 30 years. It is. Fossil fuel. Yeah, it is. By yeah. Yeah, I agree. Still, seventy-five, eighty percent of all energy. Yeah, I time. agree. Yeah. yeah, I'm trying to sort of very slowly but surely to push the EITI for taking a position on climate change and their role, but it's politically. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. certainly, that's all very challenging. I think yeah. You, Marika, for, for being honest. About the yeah. difficulties and challenges in the whole debate that was in your organization and moving ahead. Uh, at the ISR, we try to look at the crossroads of uh, the environment development mm. debate on the potential restrictions for using resources that might come out of the environmental debate at the same time, also at the development opportunities that come from turning natural endowments into well being for the people. Yeah. There are certainly a lot of things that still needs to be discussed. I have a number of questions myself, like the citizen dividend that's being mm -hmm. paid in Alaska. No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Mongolia as well, they've started Mongolia. doing it. Yeah, they've started doing it. Mongolia, yeah. Mongolia, Mongolia. Yeah. Why would you call that? Can yeah, yeah. Uh, but I suggest we close the official part. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs>